call it the Education Accountability Meeting to Order. I need a motion to um, call it to order. I'm sure that we call this meeting to order. I second. Uh, just for everybody, I want to let, uh, we have the absence of two uh, members at this time due to, uh, how do you say, uh, doctor's orders. That's why I think that personal reasons. Now I would like to make an adoption of the agenda. <clears throat> I need a motion to adopt the agenda as printed. I motion that we adopt the agenda as printed. I second it. Uh, now I would like to make <clears throat> a motion to approval of the minutes uh, for the December 9th, uh, 2019 Educational Accountability meeting. Has everyone had a chance to meet or uh, read them? Yes. I have to. So can you make a motion with this quarter? Director Carter. Oh, so we, oh, a motion that we approve minutes. Uh, second. Now we're going to do the uh, 4.0 discussion items, 4.1. <coughs> Overview of the pre-K and middle school curriculum. Reagan, just so you know, I did share an electronic copy of this with Ms. Payton that could be shared because there are hyperlinks on here and that will allow board members to actually click on each one and it opens up documents. So you can see, it was just way too much to print, right. but it gives you access to the actual resource, the website, so you can see exactly what the curriculum looks like. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, it hasn't been uploaded, hasn't been uploaded to ESB because I had to put the links in, okay. but I did just email it to her so she can okay. share it just okay. as we walk through this. Um, I can talk through some of the things, but just for your reference, if you wanted to go a little bit deeper mm. into each one. So that first, um, on the PowerPoint, the first slide really just outlines all of the curriculum for the district. So you can see starts with pre-K moves into K-12 math, K-12 ELA, and then K-12 science. And then underneath those, it talks about exactly what resource we're using for each grade level. So pre-K is creative curriculum. They also have Project Lead the Way Launch, which is our project-based um, learning and STEAM. Um, and then Go Math is our math resource that we use. Go Math also has algebra resources for the high school. Um, for uh, ELA, we have Collaborative Classroom for grades K through three, um, and that just outlines what's in that set. And then we have Being a Writer, and that's really for all of uh, K through six. So they all have Being a Writer. Um, and then for reading, grades four through six, they have Wonders. And then seven through 12 for reading ELA, they have, um, you need one more? Yeah. If you don't have it. Yep, I do. Okay. Yes, that's right. I just want to make sure we have everything. And then K-12 uh, science, we use Discovery Tech Book. And then Project Lead the Way is a part of the science curriculum. That's our STEAM and project-based learning. So just that first slide just outlines everything. And then I just kind of broke it into each section so you could see for each um, grade level so pre-k first and that's where the hyperlinks are so when you get that document you can actually click on the hyperlink so you could see more of what is creative curriculum since you specifically asked about pre-k just just to give you an idea about what they're doing so they have their curriculum broken into units so creative curriculum has units and what they do in the buildings is they determine which units all of the teachers will teach so there's so many we have to identify which ones we Feel like we should teach so that we're on the same page in both buildings mm -hmm. so just to give you an example um, at the very beginning of the year there's a beginning of the mm -hmm. year unit that really focuses on building community teaching expectations getting to know each other mm -hmm. then they go into trees and just different things that they want kids to learn about a lot of exploratory um, right now they're working on uh, pets living and non-living things 
So that's what the focus of the themes of the units will be for pre-K um, right now. And then they move into buildings, recycling, so they have different units that they work through throughout the year. So that's specifically for pre-K, for creative curriculum. And then, as I shared, we use Go Math for K-12. And then they have algebra units for the high school. And then I'll talk a little bit about kind of the benchmarking as well. And then ELA, as you can see, we use Collaborative Classroom Wonders and Study Sync. So Study Sync is what we're using at the high school for ELA. And so I included a hyperlink on that one too, so you can kind of click on that and go a little bit deeper to see. And then there's K-12 Science, and I included the Discovery Tech Book link, so it takes you right to their tech book, and you can see some of the standards and things that they're working on. So that's what that is. And then I just wanna share, in your package, you also have just an example of the pacing guide. I just printed middle school, since you asked about middle school specifically, just to give you an example of what teachers are using. Um, so you have an example of seventh grade math, and that's this one, uh, Mr. Reagan, just, there's a seventh grade math pacing guide, and then there's a seventh grade ELA. So this is kind of what teachers work on over the summer with Prep KC. They go through and they align all the standards and develop the ICANN statements, and this is how they start teaching the curriculum. So the teachers work together, and this is how they align the assessments. So we have one of these for every single grade level one for ELA and one for math. So of course I couldn't print all of that, but I at least wanted you to see an example. There is a folder that has all of the uh, pacing guides. So that's how I'm able to, to see them and see what's been updated. So our teachers do a big bulk of this, so they have control over what the pacing looks like um, in the curriculum, which is really nice. And they do this revising every summer, so they keep everything updated. So as standards change, they're right there digging in and working on the curriculum. So kudos, I mean, really our teachers do a great job of working through this. It's a lot of hard work, but they get it done. So that's just an example of what, what that would look like. You might see these in classrooms too, posted by their benchmarking charts. And so what I'll add is, if you look at the document that Ms. Franklin just highlighted for you, the pacing guides, you'll see there's a teaching window with dates there. And so we can go in any seventh grade classroom in a math class at, during these specific dates and the teachers should be teaching the same thing. And so it's uniform information so that as students, if there's ever a need to transfer from one teacher to another in the same content, we know that our students are receiving the, the, the same information. And so the summer work and the continuous work each summer allows them to plan these windows aligned with state standards. So when there are questions around our curriculum and we need up-to-date curriculum, our curriculum aligns with the Missouri state standards. So we're teaching what we're required to using these resources that she's explaining. And then the only other thing I would add is, as you can see, it also aligns to the curriculum resource. So like for new teachers, you know, it's really helpful for them to see, oh, so we're working on um, this window, August 14th through September 4th. These are the resources and the pages that are aligned to the standard. So that way they know, okay, if I go to 12.1 and go math, that is going to talk about this simple event or experimenting whatever all these standards are. So that's to really make sure everybody knows where to go and what to do. And that's really why we encourage them to use the resources and use the curriculum. Um, we want all of the kids to have access to the learning. And so a lot of times, you know, we've talked about this, when, when teachers are deviating from the curriculum, what that means is all kids in the same grade aren't getting the same thing, and we really need that to be their tier one. And then supplemental resources would be enrichment for students who may be performing at a more advanced level or intervention for students that may be struggling. Okay. So this, this is just a sample of, of pretty much what it looks like for all the grade levels. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I want to let everybody know we have a directory, watchery on the phone. Uh, he'll be listening, so I'm going to ask uh, Director Watcher, if you don't mind, could you please uh, 
mute your phone on your end, and if you need to cut in, just cut in at any time, if you don't mind. Sounds good. All right. So uh, are there any questions specifically about just the first part of the resources and the pacing guides before we move into I know it's a lot. No, I, uh, I know we, we got a new curriculum for high school, is that correct? Study sync. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, we didn't do anything yet for kindergarten yet, have we? Well, kindergarten's using... I mean, well, pre-K through eighth grade, or K through eight. So, kindergarten is using uh, the collaborative classroom. Okay. pre k is using creative curriculum, and that is recommended by the state. So, we haven't made a whole lot of changes with that because we know that that is aligned to state standards. Mm -hmm. And when a lot of times when they make a recommendation, we try to make sure that we're meeting that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we have really noticed that the teachers have really gotten better with using the curriculum. It's very robust. There's a lot of components. Um, and we've had to do some work with it just to unpack it. And that's why you see the alignment of which units we're using. Because before, we were just kind of random and everybody's just doing something. Now it's no, all teachers are doing particular units. So we can see some continuity across the classrooms. There's also uh, certain reading standards that are layered into certain units. And so we really wanted to target specific uh, units that we knew would hit at certain reading standards. So each year we learn something more about the resource. And we also get more information from the state about what they're expecting us to do. Um, they actually come and do visits and um, to check on what we're doing. They, the teachers have to turn in portfolios for accreditation. So for pre-K, it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. And so we, we definitely get oversight and monitoring to make sure that teachers are hitting all of the standards that they should be hitting. Are we noticing anything when it comes to all these different type of programs? How are the students grasping it? Are we seeing, because I do look at all these, uh, all the uh, APR little things oh, that we have had, and just looking at it, just especially, you know, uh, it seems like we're, they're not, or do we see where they're grasping it at? I think reading is, is, is our biggest stumbling block. Um, it, it is the foundation of, of all learning. So that's really why we have to get really solid in the primary grades, and that's been a primary focus with the literacy benchmarking and with the new curriculum when we, when we moved to CCC. Our goal was to really focus on reading and build those literacy scores. Unfortunately, we don't necessarily see all of the evidence of the of the work until kids are being tested and assessed more frequently. But what I would say is in our last observation in a pre-K classroom, when I watched some of the teaching going on in that classroom with uh, students, with students learning mm -hmm. patterns and um, how to identify rigorous learning for pre-K students. It, it was some of the best instruction, even though it was pre-K, that I had seen in some of the other buildings. And that really, to me, spoke volumes because that's, that's where it starts. That critical thinking, kids being able to make patterns, that's, how, that's the beginning steps of, of number sense. And to see how deliberate the teacher was in making sure every single student was doing it. That's the kind of teaching we need at every grade level. So when we start to see that happening more in the primary grades, that's where we start to have proficient readers. When we start to have proficient readers, we're going to see progress in other content areas. That reading is, that is the foundation. And so that is why we have co collaborative curriculum. That's why we ask the board um, to approve the curriculum to see if we could start to make some gains in literacy. Um, and I was really thrilled, and Dr. Cargill was there as well, to see in some of our primary grades, we're really making the headway that we want to see um, with kids learning not only literacy, but also um, early math skills. So I would say yes to your question. Um, we, we still have work to do, um, and that's part of why we have to make sure everyone's using the curriculum because that is why we purchase it. And we still, have to, we still have to work on that. You know, sometimes teachers don't want to use the curriculum with fidelity. Um, sometimes it's challenging, 
Um, it requires them to use the technology. It requires a lot of planning. Um, but we know that that's what's best for kids, and that's why we have it. And when it's being used, you can see in a classroom, you see the difference. You see the difference in engagement. You see the difference in how students are performing, and that's why we have pockets of teachers who have demonstrated that on their test scores. So when we look at test scores by teachers, we can see here's what's happening in this classroom. So that is our hope. Our hope is um, that we start to see the leverage because we're using the curriculum with fidelity. No. 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 Okay. So we have one, two, three, six. Uh, I, <coughs> did you get this the last time? This is something that you said. Okay. If you don't, I can share my I can leave it at 545. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, nope. So, gotcha. This is something else we didn't have this. They don't have that. They don't have that. That's, that's yeah. the next one. That don't matter. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the next one we're going to work through. Um, um, any questions from? No. And you're no. filling in also. So yeah. I want to make sure everybody is here and filling in. Yeah, we're good. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We can move on to 4.2 since no other. Uh, no one has any other questions right now. So in the um, initial PowerPoint packet, I included the iReady I scores, mm -hmm. and that was from our first testing window. We're right in the middle of our winter testing. So we should be done with winter testing probably that first or second week of February, depending upon the weather. Hopefully we don't miss any days, and so that'll give us our winter data. But I wanted to show that here are all of our grade levels in total school. And then I also included on there each tier so you could see. So I'm looking here first. Um, it just shows our iReady scores. But I'm sorry, there's so much information. It's That's okay. in your no, packet, yeah. that first packet. Mm -hmm. That PowerPoint. And um, it just shows reading. Mine is not staple, so it's a little bit. And math. So reading's first, and then there's math. Oh, wait, there's the reading. Does he have that? No, it's the, um, do you have the same packet like we use where you have the curriculum or did you use that one? Okay. okay. Yep, yeah, it's in that one. Okay, I got it. I got it. Go ready. I love talking about this. So do this all night. Um, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> uh, so those, those are our, our scores. And so as you can see, tier one is in the green. So those are our kids that are on or above grade level. And then tier two are kids kind of falling in the middle. So they're one grade level below. And then tier three would be students that are uh, two grade levels or more below. So those are the three tiers and where we are currently. Um, and, and as you can re may recall, we, we talked about, you know, our goal is to see a decrease in our tier three, decrease in tier two. We may see an increase in tier two if there's a decrease in tier three, meaning kids are moving in the right direction. So it just kind of depends on what that might look like. But then also we want to see an increase in tier one, kids moving from that second tier into tier one. So that's always the goal. Um, the only thing I would add is in between testing periods, that's when the intervention is taking place. So that means I will direct you to the RTI plan, and that's the one with the pyramid on the front. So that's this. So this is where we start getting into what are we doing with, with the tiers. And so this just helps with teachers. When we're talking with teachers, this is just one part of that but it just outlines what should be occurring. So that tier one would be, this is what happens with kids who are on grade level. Um, and then tier two, what are the supports and things we should be doing for tier two students? And then tier three students. And I would add that the tier two and tier three, they do a series of intervention activities and then they take another little mini assessment to see if they've made progress before we take the winter assessment. So. You know, that's how I can check in with principals to see, do you feel like kids are making progress before we test again? 
and that's what they use. They use that progress monitoring data to say, yes, we had 20 kids who moved up. So we anticipate that they will score better when they take the test in the winter. Or, oh, we're not seeing as much movement as we would hope, so we might have a few students, but there might be some who may not. That's how they're able to kind of keep a handle on the progress monitoring of students who are not at tier one. So is it fair, uh, I got two questions, I guess. Um, my first question would be, uh, what is it the percentage that you, well, I know you want to see all these to be zeros. <laughs> uh, I guess my first question would be, I guess, is this the first pyramid? Is this where we're at now, or is this where we're at now? That's where, in that green column, no, I'm saying you got two different ones. One's reading and one's oh, okay. math. Okay, 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 okay. So that's where we are in that. reading and math. Okay, so is it fair to say that we have a lot of, and it looks like in... Work to do? No, uh, we have like, I guess now we have students, I guess two grades behind. Yes, we do have a percentage a of students. And if you can see, that's why I kind of talked mm -hmm. about reading. First, uh, reading is one of the hardest things to intervene as kids get older. So, I mean, because if they haven't learned that found the foundational reading skills, they're just kind of building on top of a faulty foundation, so it's a little bit harder for them. And so if we can start down here and making sure that that reading foundation for our early learners is solid, we'll see less of that as kids move up into the intermediate grades. And so, yes, reading, is a struggle for a lot of students. And um, so what our hope is, our goal is always to have at least 50% of our kids scoring proficient in advance. So if we were talking about the math test. And so with this, if you look at our reading scores right now, we'd like to see that this increases. We may not hit that 50%, but we will kind of set kind of an informal target, like a 25% to see how close we can get to the target, continuously <laughs> trying to move students out of that second tier. I, I do have a question mm -hmm. over here. Um, because now that you've explained it, and I've had a chance to process it, mm -hmm. so the green chart is where we have for the, the district, that's where those are students that are on grade level. Or above, yes. At, or above. And the pink chart mm -hmm. is those are our students that are two plus grade levels yeah. behind. Two or more. Mm -hmm. Two or more grade levels behind. And the yellow is what? One, one grade, grade level. level. One grade level behind. Behind, yes. Mm -hmm. so ultimately, we want everyone in the green. Right. But it takes time, so as throughout the year, the goal is moving them from one tier to the other. But, I mean, in a perfect world, mm -hmm. everyone would be in the green. Yeah, my biggest concern here with this data is not the concern. I, I, it, because we just switched to the iReady test, mm -hmm. how does this compare to the STAR data? Mm -hmm. How can we look at that to see how much gains we've had since, the, you know, using star data, we just, this is a whole new situation here. It, it, yeah, it is, it is a new baseline for us. It's hard to use two different assessment tools that are very different and compare using that data. So like with star, as we started to test every year, we use that data to see our longitudinal data. How are we doing over time? Now that we have a new tool that is more rigorous, it, it, it is more rigorous. Um, we could informally look at how did we do with STAR, but it wouldn't be fair to compare both because they're just, they're two different tools. Um, this would be our baseline, and then when kids take that test in January, they're taking it right now, um, those scores, that's really the comparison basis. How are kids doing? Now, I could look at, you know, just kind of an informal pattern like, okay, where did we start last year with STAR? We could still just look at that and see. Do we see that we're kind of starting in a different place? But it's, it's just a different test, so it's really hard to say that the 19% in STAR is the same as a 19% in iReady. I would not say that. Right. I would say that kids who are here in this tier one are probably really kids who 
are proficient or advanced kids. I feel more confident in that because of the rigor of the test. As I sat down and watched students take the test myself, and I did that with STAR as well, um, I literally sat and watched kids answer questions so I, I knew what the test was asking. I feel confident in saying that a student who's able to master the questions on the iReady, they are proficient. Uh, it was a little different with STAR in that um, there, were, there were just some anomalies with the, with the questions that I felt were more, could be troublesome for students based on experiences versus knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and so those are just some things we have to consider sometimes if kids just don't have the experience of something, doesn't necessarily mean they don't have content knowledge or an understanding of things. So. Um, this one's really adaptive, so it'll bump kids up to a higher question, see if they can answer it, and if they miss it, kind of takes them down a little bit, really trying to figure out where they are. Um, I could see that a lot better when kids were taking the I ready versus me being able to really see that with STAR. That was probably way more than Vice President. Go ahead. Um, uh, how many were, how many students, um, or what percentage of students did not were not able to take the um, baseline testing to be able to provide? You know, we tried to test as many, and I do have a report that shows exactly how many students took the test. So what we do is. The goal is to make sure every student takes the test. Right. And so we have a testing schedule. So for example, if a student's absent, the supplemental teacher is right there, they pull the student in, they test them separately from the class. The trickiest part is students coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, we have a set window. So if kids miss that window, they don't test because then it interferes with the baseline data. It changes it. So we don't, we wait until the next window. So then they become a part of that window and then that's their baseline. Okay. So that's just a way to keep the data clean. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Franklin, you stated that uh, <clears throat> they are testing right now for February. When would that data be ready? Barring no major weather issues, um, we're hoping that second week of for uh, board presentation March 12th. Yeah. And so we'll have it. They may be done, and they'll be done in February, so. You know, I guess I, I'm looking at the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders who will be getting ready to go to the, uh, well, especially the eighth graders who will be able to go over to the senior high building next year. And it's a, a lot of them that are two plus and are above on uh, grade levels behind. And um, I was reading in articles and I've shared with some of my other uh, colleagues that have we looked at uh, maybe uh, pulling some of these computers and, and maybe stressing and looking at more reading and, and, and math before we give out these computers. Uh, it seems like I noticed that a lot of people are starting to take the computers away and bring it back to books. Uh, and a lot of schools are starting to do this in rural areas too. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to see how this compares with what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. I know the state has its own guidelines. I know the state has, but is there anything that states that we as a district cannot do that anymore? Or is this just something that we looked at that we're looking at for the future? Or I mean, I understand the future is computers, but it seems like they're, the kids are really skipping over the things that they really need to do because computers are now, you can get the answers. And it's kind of like cheating in a way. So if we're going back to the books, uh, a lot of them looked at that. So I guess that's my question. You know, it, it is a conundrum with, with technology because obviously we have to have it. Um, students have to be able to use it. They have to be proficient in being able to use it. And it serves many purposes. I mean, we need our kids to leave here proficient in using technology in multiple ways. Just to make it in the workforce is not an option. But how do we balance that with kind of putting your hands on a book and really digging in and doing some work. And so we really expect to see a combination of the two. Um, it's not exclusively, we're not picking up books. Our resources that we use, our curriculum resources have both hard books 
and digital resources. So there's both for teachers and students. We really do encourage a balanced approach. Um, kids should hold books. That's why we have book bags for kids to take home. We have classroom libraries. So we're never going to completely eliminate textbooks or library books or reading books. Um, we just want kids to have options and we want them to be able to access both. So if they don't have a hard book at home, they can access all of our books digitally. Um, so we don't really want to take anything away. We want them to be able to be um, able to utilize all of the resources that we have available. We want them to be proficient in technology as well. So we, we just have to find, keep that balance and uh, sometimes we see that that's something we have to work on in classrooms where we don't want it to be that kids are just sitting on a device. That's not instruction. The device is not teaching the student. It's used as a tool. And so um, we, we, we have to monitor that too. I, you know, I won't pretend like that's not something we have to keep an eye on. So is it fair to say, looking at reading and math, um, if you cannot read or cannot I mean just looking at the percentages that we have here mm -hmm. seems like this is what's our problem uh, it looks like they cannot read and they can't do arithmetic and it's getting seems like as they get older it's getting more and more higher as they're getting older so some higher somewhere we're missing them either in middle school trying to get this back looking at it or and I noticed that the third graders are always They've been there for the last three years. I've noticed third graders, we're losing them. So somewhere between third and middle school, how can we, since we do see this, uh, how can we strongly start uh, incur uh, getting more reading and more arithmetic going? Because I understand we're doing the computers, but even though we're you know, giving them the computers, we're still low. And I guess that's a problem. And I guess that's where all our our foundation is right here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we got computers, yeah, we gotta get them ready, but they can't read and they're not mm -hmm. arithmetic. And that's that's a lot that you're gonna need. Can I ask why we took out I noticed we took out person in schools, not only here <laughs> in our district, but yeah. I heard you speak about technology and how in the workforce we need the technology and you're right, we have to be on computers. But in the same essence, in the workforce, they have to learn how to sign documents. They can't just print their mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear is when they come, they have to sign documents, which we have to do all day long. Yeah. And they're just learning how to print their name. Yeah. And they're getting told, don't write curses, don't use cursive. But they have to in the future. When you go to a job in the real world, you have to have curses. Yeah. So mm -hmm. is that something only, I mean, I see it at all, a lot of districts. Mm -hmm. But is that something we just can't do at all? Bring it, back. It, right. it really isn't it really isn't one of those mm -hmm. things where you just can't do it you know mm -hmm. it's always been up for debate even when I was a principal it was something that the district just went round and round about mm -hmm. teachers were all round and round about teaching it because it wasn't necessarily a standard the state took it out of the standards so that's when all the hoopla came when the state removed it as a standard so districts were tr trying to make a determination as to whether or not they would continue to teach it. Right now, most districts don't because the state is not requiring that we do. So that's really where that came from. We don't tell teachers you can't. We don't say that. Third grade teachers are pretty staunch about it. Mm -hmm. It's a priority for them. Um, and we don't tell them that they can't. And so, a lot of them still build that in. You'll see that they have some little writing uh, handbooks and things like that. It's just not a state standard anymore, so you won't see it in curriculum. You won't see the state mentioning that. Kids won't be tested in any way. Um, it just It's not a priority, but I told my teachers as a principal, if you guys can work that in because they didn't want to take it out, I had the latitude. The district said, hey, we're not saying you can't, but we're not saying they have to. So I let my third grade teachers do it because they were very, very, very adamant that they could get everything done and teach handwriting, you know, teach cursive. No, I just don't see why that's not important to when you know you get in the real world, you have to sign documents. They're not going to let you just, just print your name right here. I mean, it's a signature requirement. And I, that's why I feel like the old ways of teaching, to me, 
this technology is taking more of their brain oh, because yeah. I can see now it's so easy. I'm not. I mean, honestly, it's easy to hit Google, yell into Google, and then sometimes they got these tablets and their brain is so overwhelmed. Throw a textbook in their face and they're lost. They're looking like, yeah. can you read this? And I'm so used to reading textbooks, doing work and math. I think it gives them more structure than these technologies because it's just. It's overwhelming sometimes, and they're just like robots. They're programmed too. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's a scary thing because we're not digital natives, and they are. Like, that is their first language versus right. how we were taught. And so it's just something to remember that that is their norm mm -hmm. versus what's our norm, and then we're adapting to the digital world. It'll be even more so as they become adults. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to even think about what's to come because it's so different than what I would like to see, you know, having to adjust. Um, and so that's why we try to find a balance um, to the change where technology, I mean, really is consuming everything. It is. Whether we like it or not. And I, I mean, I can't say that I'm comfortable with all the things that we, we are doing with, with technology. However, um, you know, we, we, we are always being challenged to make sure kids are prepared for jobs beyond the jobs that are currently okay. existing. So it's right. not even what they can do now, it's jobs that will exist when we're not here. And so, and, and that is the future. I mean, they want kids to be able to, to communicate, collaborate, work with, work with a team, but they want them to code, they want them to be able to build, they yeah. want them to be, all of that is via some device or tool yeah. or digital resource. It, it doesn't take the place of things, but we just know that, you know, for a student to be well-rounded, they really need a little bit of everything. Yeah. You know, they need a little bit of everything. We want them to be able to read a text, that we want them to be able to get on that device, we want them to be able to have a conversation that doesn't require texting or typing, all those skills, they still have to have all of that. And it's really hard to compete with yeah, technology. I'm not, I'm not gonna get smarter yes. than technology, I don't like that. I mean, I'm asking for help, I'm like this brain is like that technology. And so that's what we have in front of us every day. And so we can't teach outside of that. We have to really stimulate that because that's really, that's their name. Yeah, that is, yeah. like, you're right. It's, Something you can't bypass it's everywhere. <laughs> I know. I mean, I love to do things the way it was when I was in the classroom or when I was a student. I loved school and it was so different. But and and we sometimes we're tempted to do that <laughs> because it's easier. But we we have to meet them where they are. So, sure. so <clears throat> from what I from what I understand, for the information that you guys have. Pro had provided previously when it came to iReady that um, even with the reading, and I, and I uh, was on the phone listening as far as uh, those who are struggling, those who are in the red, um, are given more instruction. Yes, and so it's really kind of, that's when the teachers will put students in small groups. So okay. you hear a lot of us saying things about a small group, and that's really how they're grouping students. So when students fall into a particular tier, they're coming up to work with the teacher or being assigned different lessons that really hit at those targeted areas um, where we see the skill deficits. The other thing is, you know, this was our first time taking the assessment, so I, I don't want to minimize that either. This is their first time doing it, and so some of it is just acclimating to a new assessment. The other part of it is, you know, sometimes kids aren't showing what they know when they take a test. I mean, we've seen on the test, it'll show you if a student is just kind of clicking buttons. We've had some of our brightest students doing that. I mean, we can go through the data and it'll show a little dot that, oh, this student rushed through the test, this student rushed, and so the teachers go. These are even in some cases a gifted student. So we have instances where kids are taking it, but they're probably not doing their absolute best. And that's very common when you get to middle school and, and the school. secondary. They're like, why do I need to take this test? What is it gonna do for me? It doesn't have any bearing on whether or not I'm going to the next grade. So that's part of it too, making sure kids are really taking it seriously. I think that's some of the hurdle uh, that we experience with the upper grades. Primary grades, the kids are pretty much gonna do what teachers ask them to do and do their best. 
But in some cases, we saw that we had to really talk to a few kids. I need you to take this and do your best. And then they come back and it's exactly where they should have been. Right. But if we weren't that deliberate, we could miss some kids who are just not showing what they know. Because so that's it, always part of it too. Because the reason why, and that was kind of leading to that, because the reason why I was asking was based on the fact that most, um, <laughs> majority, there's a large percentage of kids who are at an on or above level who, um, when it comes to te test taking, no, don't necessarily take tests well. Absolutely. And I can, I can see, I, and I won't project, but I can see the numbers changing within each group going forward yeah. just based on the fact that those kids who are getting, mm, I would say, put in, put in groups in which they mm -hmm. feel like they're a little bit more proficient and working, them, working their way out of those groups because of the fact that when they start in red, when they're actually being green, they're like, why am I in a small group right. <laughs> working on this? Right. And, and have to show through their work, their availability to be able to progress through it. Now, even with test taking per se, um, mm -hmm. test taking has always had more of a skew to it Absolutely. based on the fact that they're just, they're, they're great students that don't, they're not very good test takers. And that's, that's, a, that's always a part of it. Um, I've seen it so many times. It, it, it's, you know, for some students, they're I'm just not them, test so. takers. And yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's all those factors that play into kind of looking at a test score. That's why it's so hard to just kind of talk about data this way because there's so many variables um, that go into a student doing well on a test. And it's just one take test. Think we, we try to take into account how kids are feeling that day kids aren't feeling well, guess what? They're just not going to do their best. So there's a lot of variant uh, variables that we have to consider, but in short, I mean, we have to have something. And so this is, this is where we are right now based on um, the first round of testing. And so we, we just will take it one test at a time and hope to see those gains and just chipping away at those at those numbers in that in that tier three column which is really hard we should see more movement in tier two it takes longer obviously to move students out of tier three because of the deficits thank you one more question I'm sure. on with this. is there a follow-up with the uh, parents uh, on your how your student is doing and I guess um, because I'm looking at the yellow two, and that's mm -hmm. one grade behind, even though those are two plus. So basically, an eighth grader is really seventh grade in math and so on and so forth. I guess, my, how are we implementing that to follow up with the student to make sure that they are really, because, I mean, I'm looking at this, and I just, not being able to read nor arithmetic, and you're two grades behind in one, that's, that's kind of harsh. I mean, hard for me. And especially when we're trying to, you know, how do we get these parents involved to get mm -hmm. the kids to get in and somehow, uh, you know, make it mandatory to get the child in the uh, tutoring or whatever. I mean, we don't, we can't do anything of that nature here or so we can't, I mean, you know. I, I would just say that um, when we take the assessment, the information is uh, sent home to parents about testing so there should be a letter that goes home the coaches are responsible for generating the letters and sending those home with students so it will kind of walk a parent through here's where they scored here are some of the skills that they struggled with um, and so that lets the parent know these are some of the areas that the teacher will will target in the small group um, you know things are always a little harder at the upper grades as far as you know what parents can do to intervene at that point. Um, it just looks a little bit different, addressing concerns, reading concerns, and things like that. So obviously we have to hit it from both ends, making sure it's happening in the early grades and intervening while we ha when we have students who are struggling. Um, so that's part of it. We send the information home. We do recommend tutoring, so we do have tutoring. Permission slips are sent home to students. We do prioritize students who are in tier two and three for tutoring. So they are the ones that get the permission slips first. We're lucky in that we have link and so a lot of parents will take advantage of tutoring. They don't have to worry about transportation. And so we have kids already in the buildings that can participate in tutoring if parents give permission. 
I do think in general parents are, are really concerned. Um, they they try to figure out ways that they can help at home. That that's generally how I feel. They want to they want to help and they want their kids to do well in school. So there's a letter that you said is sent home to mm -hmm. require certain students to be in tutoring. Right. Well, we don't require them to go. Ask for them to be. We we do send a permission slip if parents want them to go, but the letter is really in reference to the iReady scores. Okay. Just letting parents know we took the assessment, here's where your student scored. Oh, okay. So I was thinking that there were letters sent home saying that, hey, you know, would you want your kid to be in tutoring because we've seen these are the areas that they're struggling it's in. It's almost like we would do both on them. Okay. So send that information home. Oh, this is a student that needs to go to tutoring. Mm -hmm. So then the parent permission behind that. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Anybody? And then I, oh, okay, and then I think I talked about the benchmarking um, standards, but if there's questions about that, I can. What is the benchmark standard? I guess, what is the uh, district benchmark? What is the old guys' percentage of what do you want the students? Or? Oh, benchmarking that way. Yeah, okay. I that's to make what sure I was clear about. Just like we, I think I, I thought I'd put that in there. Okay, yeah, I think I just misunderstood when, when I saw benchmark, I was thinking benchmarking, um, and that's why I printed all of the standards. Um, so we're always trying to go for the 50% or, or higher. We want at least 50% of our students scoring proficient and advanced. I mean, we're not at that target, clearly. It, it is a, a target that's um, something we're really going to have to work towards. What really makes that feasible is the number of kids that we see performing in tier two. So if we're looking at tier two, these are kids who are right here in the middle, one grade level below. We're really thinking how many of these kids can we move? <coughs> so our soft target is the 25%. Ultimate target is that 50%. So that's what our hope is that we're gonna move these kids out of that tier two into this tier one. Now, of course, I'm not saying that we're gonna move all of them at once, but that's where we want to start to see that movement. What about, um, in reference to them going to after school tutoring, do you think Saturday school will maybe boost some of them, give them a little more? I know some teachers are not gonna be all on board with it, yeah. but I just would like to sit, you know, know, what do you think about Saturday school? Will that help? So, you know, I, I will say this. I, I do, just philosophically, I, I do struggle with um, students spending so much time in school and not having time for leisure. Mm -hmm. So I do think about that. I do think that I operate from the stance of if we really sure up what's happening during the school day, mm -hmm. then we don't need to then put kids in school longer. That's just me personally. Um, I believe kids should have play. I think they should have a break from school. I think they should spend time with family and taking more time away from families, I don't know that that is the answer. First tier, I feel like if we can sure up, we have kids, what, six, seven hours a day? It's a lot of time that kids are sitting in front of, of adults being taught. How do we maximize the time that we already have with students? And then on the back end, if we can say with 100% certainty, everything that they should be getting, they're getting in those six or seven hours, supplement. But I think about them having activities right. and sports, like you know, that's being well-rounded. Right. And so it's just hard. I mean, I get it. We want kids in school and learning, but when do they, when do they have a break from school if we continue to? Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's just finding a balance, but we do offer that. And so if, if principals want to do a Saturday tutoring session, they can schedule that mm -hmm. if they have teachers who will do it. That's the biggest barrier. Right. Sometimes teachers don't want to give a Saturday or that two-hour block of time. Right. But if they do, they can they can yeah. set it up. And if parents want kids to come, we can we, we go ahead and let them do it. Okay. But uh, is uh, this a uh, <coughs> let No, go ahead. No. So since we're from, I just want to go back to this. It, it looks, and I'm agree with you. I like the way it's laid out, the curriculum, but. Are we having trouble? Do you think it's the struggle with teachers staying on task with 
Because I seen how, when I was reading, I was like, well, this is a little micromanaged. Like, so like, and then I thought about it, I was like, well, are we having this problem where the teachers are not sticking to what you have laid out for them, the curriculum? So we're having to go back and kind of reprogram their mind and say, hey, this is what we have here. This is what you need to stick to. Is that the reason why maybe we are struggling so hard and falling behind because we don't have our teachers following the, the plan? I think we probably have a little bit of all sorts of things that could be occurring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is pacing. Sometimes it's teacher skill. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's just a litany of things that could uh, play a part in why kids aren't learning at the, at the level that we think they should be. Um, as far as the curriculum, we know that if we say a student has completed seventh grade curriculum, they've gone through all the standards okay. so what we try to appeal to teachers is that if you're not teaching all of the standards that means your kids are leaving this classroom and they haven't been exposed to all of the seventh grade standards not okay and so we want kids to know seventh grade standards we've got to teach them otherwise they don't go to eighth grade teaching seventh grade standards guess what they're teaching eighth grade, eighth grade standards so that's always a discussion that we have with teachers about the pacing and the exposure to skills. I mean, think about if, if teachers said, I can't get through everything, I'm only gonna do half of it. Mm -hmm. What happens to the other half of the standards that the student didn't get exposed to? Yeah. You ever ask them for their opinions or advice on something they think we can improve it or oh, a reason yes. why we don't, why they're not doing what we, allow, we want them to do? A lot of it is based on the teachers who participate. Mm -hmm in the summer benchmarking and the ones who are heavily involved in doing this, mm -hmm. you will see that they are the ones that really are most skilled at it. Okay. So really it's just a matter of the more you are in there at the table, the better you're going to be, you're gonna know the standards, your voice is at the table, we should be doing this in unit one and not this. We should move this to unit four because here's where kids are getting ready for fifth grade. That's what the teachers all do if they go to benchmarking. So teachers who didn't go are kind of like, wait a minute. Right, lost. Okay. And so we try to get them on board too. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a part of it. So we've seen, there's some teachers that have done benchmarking for four or five consecutive years. They've mastered the standards. So they know everything that a student should be learning. Okay. So that's part of it, that we want teachers to get more skilled. And, and I'm going to add, even though this isn't my Erickson, but you, <laughs> the great thing about this, if you look at it at the top, it gives you a window. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, Ms. Franklin and her team, and even us as the OT, we'll go in and we'll do observations. And it's really great when we go to this school and see a third grader, go to another school, a third grader, and we know that they're on task because yeah. they're doing what they're supposed to within that window. They're yeah. doing mm -hmm. the same benchmark. So we can see if there is somebody that perhaps is not. Mm -hmm. then we can you know talk to the principal to go about address it with that teacher because you know that is part of it and I, and I hate to you know, I didn't use the word micromanaging but it is a way of aligning mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody is hitting the required right. curriculum yeah. so. and there was a point in time when we did not have that we, we couldn't say what should kids be doing right now in third grade that's kind of like this that yeah that's kind of scary to think that we didn't have anything to guide that and the other thing I would add, it, it really is about equity. Every single third grader should be getting the same thing, whether they're at Millennium, whether they're at Warford. Right. And so this is how we can ensure that everyone knows you should be teaching mm -hmm. fractions just like Warford, just like Ingalls, just like Truman. Nobody gets to just kind of, hey, I'm just gonna do something different. Right. So that, that's part of it too, we want okay. to make sure it's equitable. Scorch. All right. Uh, I'm going to move along to 4.4 student handbook. Okay. I've given you all uh, just a brief handout that kind of tells you where we are. Um, you know, the last time we met was right before we got out on December 11th. In fact, I don't know if Director Watts was there mm -hmm. during that time. I know, you, I believe he was there for part of the time. Miss Briggs actually um, zoomed in for a little bit of the meeting as well. And, and basically what we're doing is we're going through the entire current handbook the way it is now. And if you look at that segment, we're making changes. We're looking at the wording of every offense, um, what it describes into it. We're looking to see if we need to make any changes. We're also heavily looking at the dispositions. We're separating some into elementary and having some of that elementary 
and secondary. Some we're leaving as like all inclusive. And when we finish all of this, we're going to go back and assign a tier like tier one, tier two, um, tier three, and so forth. And so all of this is being made. Our next meeting is actually this Thursday coming up at two o'clock. And if you notice, these are the remaining categories. And you know, really, to be honest, what we've done is we're back really right around technology is where we left off. Um, we on purpose um, kind of skipped some of the bullying, the bus discipline, and so forth. Some of those need everybody in the room um, to get all basically thoughts behind that because those are a little bit more controversial. Um, to be honest, we do have a lot of challenges when it comes to cyberbullying, bullying, and so we want to make sure that we address that with all the minds in the room. So we've left some of those higher profile, if you will, to come back to the circle around. And you know, and then some of them we haven't gotten to yet. We want to look at the weapons, to be honest. I know that's one that everybody has a interest in. And to be honest, you know, right now if you start looking at it, um, you know, the question is, like, for instance, do we need to come in and get more specific with it? Do we need to say a knife two inches or greater, a knife two inch, or less than two inches, and so forth? Those are the questions the committee has to tackle, you know, to bring to the board and say, here's what we think, and then, of course, get your input. Um, so, basically, we're going through all of this. We're going to tie the tiers to it, look and see where restorative practices can. Then we're going to have an intro to it, basically, what the tier system is, what restorative practices are, and and one thing I did leave out on this, but but because really kind of this is the handbook itself. But after everything's said and done, we're going to have to start the year next year with training based on what we determine is going to be in the handbook. So when do you expect this handbook to be finished? Then we're 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 on time right now to bring it to the board uh, February. Okay, we're on time. So you say you wanted to train people. When you start, why well, like for instance, when we start talking about restorative practices, we had a training on restorative practice in the district. Dr. Cargill's first year, or maybe their second year in the district, mm -hmm. we did some training for everybody in the district. Well, to be honest, we haven't really done that since. Mm -hmm. Some of the schools have done it on their own, especially in the secondary. They brought in the Center for Conflict for Resolution. Um, so they've had some other people who've come in and work with them restorative practice, but not everybody has. And so we're going to, what we've been talking about doing is doing a small training in those first, you know, we have those first five, six days beginning uh, prior to students starting where we do training with teachers. That's when we're talking about how bringing somebody in and having every teacher going through some training on the sort of practice at that time. But it's really kind of difficult. You know, for one, to be honest, my idea of what restorative practice may differ from yours. And we all need to be on the same page when we're looking at the handbook. I'm looking forward to seeing that in the years to come. Hopefully, it's changed a lot. And, and you know, I'm gonna tell you, we've talked oh, about and we've talked about this. This handbook hasn't been touched mm -hmm. in a while. Mm -hmm. And so, to be honest, it may be even after we do all of this a couple of years down the road, changed. it may need to be tweaked again. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is something that you know we need to keep an eye on. Um, and the good news is, you know, right now with everybody that we have on this. I think you know we have a lot of the key uh, people that need to be on this on this committee. However, that being said, because they are key, and, and that's one of the reasons why some of these are still left here, we have had some challenges getting everybody at the meetings um, because you know we have the APs, we have mm -hmm. curriculum director, um, our assistant superintendent. You know we have everybody there, and sometimes it's been very difficult to get everybody there at the same time. So we sent out um, an email saying. We really need everybody to get to that. We have two more scheduled right now. We have this one scheduled on the 16th and one more. And again, we can schedule more if we need to, and we probably will. But it's crucial trying to get everybody here in January so we can address these topics. How, uh, how are these committees, uh, how do you all select the people that's going to be on there? Just in case other parents might want to get more involved, how can we get them more involved? Because I've never seen these groups. I've seen probably one group since I've been here. Mm -hmm. well, and that's honest, when we was working on that strategic planning about a long time ago now. Yeah, that was a different group. But we have, I mean, we, that's the only groups I've ever seen. Well, for this particular committee, this was tasked to uh, Ms. Womble and myself, and we got together and tried to determine 
who we would want to be on this committee because you get too many people on there, you can't get anything done. So we tried to pick representatives from, you know, teachers. You know, so we got the, we got, you know, in fact, I, I've already given you the list of everybody. It's not on this one. I'm sorry, I took it off because I've given it to you before. But you know, we have the head of the union, Miss April Allen, on it. We have several secondary administrators. We have elementary administrators. Again, we have CNI. We have student services. We have Dr. Williams, the hearing officer, on it. We have a parent on it. So we just kind of picked a small representative group to be a part of it. We did not put it out there to ask for volunteers. That's not what we wanted. That would have caused a lot but of problems. I guess my thing is, how do you select a parent? Like, how do you get a parent that you say, okay, I want this, this is a parent that I know. How is that process? That's what I'm saying. Well, for I one, I wanted to pick a parent that was involved in the school and I know that could be there. Um, so we picked a parent that was also an employee to be there. Okay. That's good. And she definitely is very active and participates. I mean, which is really important because she will give her honest perspective as a parent, which we we need to hear that perspective. And she talks to parents frequently. And so she can share, you know, here's what I hear parents say, or here's what it sounds like the issue is at schools. So that that's also key um, and has been very helpful having her voice. Well, what I've seen in, in this committee meeting, she's very vocal and mm -hmm. assertive as well mm -hmm. with addressing and also providing analogies in which she has dealt with in her own personal life to be mm -hmm. able to, yeah. to provide reference. I mean, because, and, and I will tell you one thing as, as an administrator, and I've been doing this a long time, mm -hmm. I have seen a lot. So sometimes I may look at something and think I'm really helping the parent or the <laughs> child by not addressing it, maybe as harsh. As I could, and she will come in and say, "No, no, that needs to be more than that. You, you can't just suspend the student for one day for that. They need to be suspended longer." Right. And, and so, you know, it, it is one of those ones to have that checks and balances between the different roles. That's good. When it comes to restorative practices oh, and and what um, I've me uh, <laughs> me and Dr. Skinner have been able to meet as well as been able to went at the last meeting, I was able to kind of. Um, provide some context of what restorative practices is, uh, uh, even in pairing from uh, what would be considered zero tolerance policies and w how those two things reflect. And the aspect of restorative practices is not so much as a program or training in which you have to deal with as a um, working culture in which uh, would be implemented just the same as uh, we have uh, done our racial equity piece. And in, in all actuality, it collaborates well with the racial equity piece and it's been seen well in San Diego, San Francisco, and some of the information in which uh, provided to the committee have been from those places which often provide kind of the context in the, back, in the backbone for how to implement, how to get those things started, and how to keep those things going so you can see the results in, in the in, in the uh, last presentation, uh, last uh, review of the student handbook revisions, uh, numbers were put up to show uh, in those very high populated, high dense places, which uh, how much of a change has occurred when it came to students assaulting teachers, teacher, uh, students assaulting each other, and seeing just the decrease in um, student discipline. So uh, it's it's an evidence-based practice. So the evidence presented has shown that the practice of it, when done efficiently, has uh, outstanding results. Yeah, the only other thing I will add is, you know, again, when we present this, which again, everything's on line right now to finish this in February, there are gonna be so many changes from what our current handbook has. I'm gonna strongly encourage each board member to really read it. Yeah. I mean, I can highlight and talk about certain things, but there are a lot of changes in this when you look at that compared to what we're currently having, what we're proposing. What is the name of this committee again? Is that it's the Student Handbook. The Student Handbook Committee? Mm -hmm. And I never heard about this thing. First time I'm hearing about it. It was like, uh, oh. presented in a uh, policy meeting. It was presented at the last board. You stood I, up and presented. Um, oh, the policy meeting probably wasn't. We, we've talked about it a few times. But, um, Even yeah. in open session for the last three months, we've kind of talked about yeah. it. In, uh, it's, it's, it's been work, we've been working on it since September. Yeah. Yeah. We want to update on it. 
Because uh, I think we've met. Um, you met with us two or three times. Yeah. Is it here this Thursday? After it's um it's actually upstairs in CNI, and I uh, student service conference room. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Uh, anybody six point oh for future agenda items? I have to contact the uh, EA. Uh, Education committee to see if they're going to put on something, so we'll postpone that, uh, Ms. Mrs. Charles, uh, so uh, we can get the agenda in to you after they have a chance to give some feedback. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Uh, Director Watry and, and Director um, Carter for coming and filling in today for the education committee. Uh, I do appreciate you guys for coming and help us out, and thank you also. Uh, Ms. Franklin and uh, Dr. Skinner. Uh, moving right along to 5.1. Um, oh, I skipped it. Oh, okay. Uh, regular session board meeting January 16, 2020 at 6.30. Uh, 5.2 policy committee will meet February the 4th, 2020 at 5.30. Uh, the education accountability committee meeting will be February 10th at 5 o'clock. Uh, the Finance Committee meeting will be February 11, 2020 at 5.30, and 5.5 .5 Facilities Committee meeting February 13, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. Uh, there is nothing, well, the only thing that I see that's going to the board would be the student handbook tomorrow, I mean on Thursday, is that correct, Dr. Skinner? It's not that's going the, this Thursday. No. It's not going this Thursday? Okay. No, it's going in February. No. Okay, it'll be in February, okay, so there's nothing. And at this time, I'm asking for a motion to adjourn this meeting. I so motion to be adjourned this meeting. Second. Second. All right, this meeting is adjourned at 618.